I think I realised as a kid, about 10 or 12, that kids split into two groups. You get your sport fans, who are totally into reality. Then you get the ones who are rubbish at sports. So, what do they go into? Escapism, fantasy. They have imaginations. I think, generally speaking, I don't think sports fans have much imagination. I do remember that when I was in my last year at junior school, so I can specifically say I was 10 years old, we all used to have to write stories. Um, and we would put them into nice little folders and do drawings on the front. And the best ones would be read out in class. And I know that I always used to end up getting mine to read out. And what I developed, even at the age of 10, was catchphrases. So each time I would be asked to read out my latest story, which would of course be a horror story, a ghost story, because we all know kids love to be frightened. There would always be a line that would come up in it somewhere that would be a voice saying, you'll be sorry. And it got to the stage that having read a load of these out to the other kids in class, I would say, suddenly they heard a voice and it said, and the entire class would say, you'll be sorry. And I think I realized at that age of 10, that this was great. I was communicating with my audience. They were loving it. If only I'd have thought of putting a price on it, I could have sold it to them. Initially, I was called upon to write a report on the state of British Marvel, as it was called, because they were failing. It was being produced out of New York. They had no awareness of our market. In America, they would print a million copies, maybe, of a comic to sell a quarter of a million. Three quarters of a million of the copies distributed around this vast continent would not be sold. It was, it was a different language to them. Um, even the anthology title, the idea that a comic has a generic title like Victor, Hotspur, Eagle, Buster, so that if Westerns are popular, the front cover character is a cowboy. The American approach is give everybody their own comic, sink or swim. Yeah, we don't take those kind of risks. But it was failing, failing miserably. Stan had tried his best ideas, Spider-Man, Fantastic Four and uh, Avengers. And then he was down to his second best ideas. And by the time they were talking to me, they were reprinting Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. Now, there's no way that British kids were really going to believe that seven American howlers saved Europe. It, it, it might have worked well in American comics, but it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna swim. So I wrote a report, and I remember to this day, it was a 10 page report, and it was so critical, I thought, I can't, I can't charge money for that. I've just, I've just tore them to shreds. You know, I've just told them that they're rubbish. And I'm expecting them to give me money for telling them they're rubbish. So I'd throw it away and I'd rewrite it and I'd just calm it down a bit and rewrite it again and again. And eventually I submitted it. And it was because of the report that Stan invited me to have that weekend in Bristol. And he spent that weekend trying to convince me to carry out the ideas I'd come up with and actually take over running British Marvel and change it into, into the way I thought it should be. Um, which was incredible, you know, and he said to me, this was the line, this was the most amazing thing. He said, he said, Des, <laughs> I don't want you to waste your time editing comic books. Come up with the idea. Get it right, give it to somebody else. Come up with another idea. Get it right, give it to somebody else. And he actually just wanted me to do what I would love doing most, and that was coming up with new ideas, getting the writers, getting the artists, doing the first few issues, getting it sorted, and then giving it, if you like, to a production editor, who, who would then 
on a weekly basis move pieces of paper from one side of his desk to the other. Whereas I would just sit there going, wow, what can I come up with now? <laughs> and I, that's what I was being paid to do. It was absolutely ridiculous. I'd been given the best sandbox on the planet. <sighs> Mixing metaphors, I'd been given Stanley's toys to play with in his sandbox. And he gave me a free hand. How cool is that? Art is rhetorical. It was phenomenally cool. So I could pick and choose which Marvel characters I wanted to use. Now the thing about Britain is we don't need superheroes because we, like most of Europe, have got our own legends in place. We've got our gods. We've got our fantastic characters, King Arthur, Robin Hood, Merlin, Bodicea. We don't really need spandex. In the States, they've unfortunately wiped out all of their legendary heroes by killing off the Native Americans. So all of these stories that were passed mouth to mouth, generation to generation, suddenly they've been forgotten. So with the advent of things like World War II, and there aren't many things like World War II, they've had to create iconic heroes for the dumb GIs who are going out there and getting shot. So characters like Captain America, Superman, Superman's slogan was truth, justice, and the American way. It's about as oxymoronic as, a, as military intelligence. But nevertheless, the GIs love this stuff. Captain America beats the Hun. Superman has bullets bouncing off his chest. It was great patriotic stuff, but the Brits didn't want to know. We did not take to that kind of thing at all. I created what I called the Marvel Revolution. So, I turned around the existing titles into being viable enough that I had some money left over. And it, it all seems so obvious to me. I've made a career out of doing the obvious, but the biggest thing on television at the time was the Incredible Hulk. It was huge. So I thought, it's, it's got eight, nine, ten, however many million views a week on television. So I'm going to do a Hulk comic. Of course <laughs> I've made a career out of doing the obvious. But I'm not going to use the American material. I had such fun with Night Raven, in the 1930s vigilante. Wouldn't it be fun to do it again, but for ourselves? So I thought, well, instead of setting it in the past, we'll set it in the future. That would be a real change, wouldn't it, you know? But it would be enough that no one could do us on copyright infringement. So I went to the artist who'd enjoyed drawing Night Raven. I said, do you want to write it yourself this time? Because he hadn't written it previously. And he said, no, there's a guy I've worked with on a couple of backup strips in the Doctor Who magazine called Alan Moore, and he's quite good. As happens in comics, what you do is, as an editor, your job is to get the right people together, give them a rough idea of the direction you want to go in, and then leave them alone. And they came up with a character called Ace of Shades. And I thought, yeah, well, if you're a Lemmy fan, that's fine, and it's a good joke the first three times you hear it. I can't publish something with a character called Ace of Shades, it's a rubbish name. And I suddenly hit on Vendetta, and I thought, that's a great word, nobody's used it before, it's very dramatic. It's a little bit Italian for a British superhero, but it's a great word. Then I suddenly thought one day, and this was, this was, this was one of those kind of revelations that if it had been in a cartoon, I'd have had a light bulb above my head go bing! I thought Churchill had an expression in World War II, V for victory. And I thought, and in the future, the V won't be for victory anymore, it'll be for Vendetta. So I call it V for Vendetta. So Warner Brothers decided that V for Vendetta would be a good property to look at making a film of. And somehow, despite it being an anarchist hero, who blows buildings up, Warner Brothers made it. I, I think maybe they didn't get it, quite honestly. But the public did. I'm amazed to this day when I see photographs of protests in Egypt, South Africa, everywhere around the world. And people are wearing 
a mask which which wouldn't exist had I not produced Warrior in the 1980s. No, there wouldn't be V for Vendetta. It's just, wow, it's just amazing, you know. I, mean, to, I don't care whether anybody knows who I am. That doesn't matter. I don't care how much money I get out of it. That doesn't matter. What matters is that you can make a difference, that you can have an idea in a basement in New Cross, South East London, that can have reverberations across the world. That was too crass.